Okay. You're waiting. I'm waiting. And it stinks. <laughs> waiting for something to... Waiting to get something that you want is hard. Let's just say it. It's really... There's a real suffering that comes with waiting for... And I think there, there's probably a lot of different ways that you could be waiting for something. It could be like a, a, just a, a general confusion in waiting. I'm talking about things like spiritually, a waiting for clarity on something. Like maybe discerning vocation, like just waiting for clarity about like... I just, I just don't know. Or maybe there's some amount of like, I, I do know, but I don't know what the outcome is going to be. So I'm just waiting for some clarity on like, so maybe the first one is waiting for direction. Maybe you get some clarity direction, but then waiting on destination. Or then maybe you have like, I know the direction. I know the destination, but the Lord's just saying, not now. Wait. And that's hard. And there's a real suffering that comes with the waiting. And the answer to this is patience. And patience, uh, what, it, what it is, essentially, like the root, the root word, like the Latin of it means to suffer. Uh, so patience is being able to, to suffer because waiting involves some kind of suffering. But to suffer well is what patience means. And St. Thomas Aquinas calls patience the, the safeguard against sorrow. Because the alternative to like suffering well in the waiting is just being bummed all the time because you're waiting. And I'm tired of that. I'm tired of the just being bummed in the waiting. And like there's, there's more to this. So how, how do we suffer well in the waiting? What does patience look like? And I've, I've listened to a bunch of stuff and read a bunch of stuff. And a lot of what we get... Uh, like advice in terms of patience is just about perspective. Like just the, you know, I'm suffering is really hard. So just embrace it and like take on this new perspective when it comes to patience. I'm going to get, I want, we have to start there a little bit, but I also want to give some practicals, both perspective and practicals on patience. Alliteration. Let's go. So what's the lens that we need to take on the perspective that should help hopefully for us who are waiting to to suffer well and to have patience. First is the understanding that God's ways are not our ways and God's timing is not our timing because God has an eternal perspective and one day in our lives is like a thousand to God or a thousand for us is like one, <laughs> whatever. Eternal perspective, God is outside of time and he can see the destination and the direction much better than we can. So to take on God's perspective, to know that his ways aren't our ways and his ways are better, and his timing's not our timing, and his timing is better. And God always brings about things for good to those who love him. So if we can just continue to trust the Lord, trust uh, in his vision and in his timing, that's a perspective that we need. But also to know that like suffering is something that we are not alone in. And like the, the waiting, the suffering of waiting is something that we are not alone in. The example of, I think the clearest example in the scriptures is the Israelites in the desert in, in like on their way to the promised land. God has delivered them from the exodus out of Egypt, but then they're out in the desert. It says for 40 years. And what's guiding them through the desert is uh, the, the, the flame in the cloud. And it, and it says that, that only when they see the cloud move is when the Israelites move through the desert. So they have no idea when they're going to reach the promised land or like how they're arriving there. All they're doing is trusting the Lord. And when the cloud moves, they move. So they might wake up one day and be like, no idea when we're moving from this place. So they settle in for a little while and they just wait until the cloud moves. And then one day, who knows? The, then the Lord just moves. So they have no idea what the Lord's timing is going to be. But they have this promise of the promised land. They have this hope that is incredible for them waiting. And all they do is wait and trust and follow the Lord. And there's, God, there's probably going to be some real suffering there. If the Israelites did it for 40 years... And my waiting is probably not going to be that long. So to, to have some kind of consolation that the Israelites, Israelites <laughs> went through this, but also some real consolation that our Lord Jesus Christ 
went through this. The most incredible suffering, the agony of betrayal and the agony of like waiting for people to, to receive him, but also Jesus on the cross has experienced the greatest suffering. And by Jesus' suffering, it becomes something good for us. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But just to know that we're not alone in the suffering that we experience because, you know, Jesus did it, the Israelites did it. Jesus experienced the greatest suffering. But also to know, last thing about perspective, is that we do not suffer. We cannot suffer as people without hope. St. Paul talks about this, this in the first letter to the Thessalonians. He says to instructing people about grief and people who die, he says, he instructs us, do not grieve as people without hope. And for us, do not suffer as people without hope because we believe in Jesus Christ who did suffer and he died, but he resurrected. And the whole Christian story and the story and the trust in the Lord that we have is we have a God of resurrection. We have a God of silver linings and hope that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and he promises good things for us. So if we're waiting now, if we're suffering now, then there must this must not be the end. And there must be some hope yet to come. So to cling to this and that we ought to live, St. Paul tells us, as people with hope. This is what it means to be Christian. So patience necessitates hope. This is how we can suffer well, is to cling to the hope uh, that God is faithful and he has only good things for us. So that's like the fine and good perspective stuff of like God's timing, God's ways, and there's hope at the end of this, and Jesus suffered, and we can too, and all of that. But like practically, what does what does this look like? for Like what are the things that we can actually do in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the waiting to make it easier and to, to suffer well? What does what does like the practice of patience actually look like? So I think two things. The first one being that suffering is meaningless unless it's redemptive. And suffering becomes for us redemptive suffering by the suffering of Jesus. This is this is some of the one of the beautiful things about the Paschal mystery of Jesus who comes to be one of us and then he suffers and he dies and he resurrects. That Jesus in his death on the cross and in his his suffering and his passion he extends to us the invitation to unite our suffering to his. That when we do, when we offer up the little sufferings that we have, they become united to Christ. We become united to him. And he takes our suffering as something that is good and redemptive for the life of the world. The way that we can practically find this most is going to Mass. And I would say go to Mass as often as possible because of this. This is the, the ideal place. I mean, every day, just to say like, Lord, I'm suffering and I offer this to you, unite it to you, make it good for, and make it particular, make it specific for like, Lord, I'm offering up this, this suffering right now for this person's good or for my future spouse or for whoever, whatever you're waiting for. I don't know. Uh, but especially in the Mass, we find this in a particular way that in the offertory and like the preparation of the gifts and the altar, um, the congregation brings forward bread and wine to be consecrated, to be to become the offerings that take place on the altar. It's the, the priest says the the work grown of the earth and work of human hands. May this become the bread of life. May this become the offering that we give. And it's symbolic of us bringing forward our own offering, our own sacrifice, our own joys, and our, our, our own sorrows, our sufferings. This is the point in the Mass where we can offer to the Lord in a very distinct way our sufferings. Because then what does the priest say? He says, may my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. So he gathers up all of our offerings, our sacrifices, our sufferings. And then what do we say? May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name for our good and for the good of all his holy church. That the offering that we bring forward, our suffering that we give and we place on the altar in the mass, somehow becomes united to Christ's. And Christ's suffering brings forth life for the world. So ours, in some way, becomes redemptive, united with Jesus, that it becomes for our good and for the good of all the church. This happens in a real way at Mass. So I would say to make our sacrifice of suffering be redemptive is to offer it, offer it up daily, but especially to go to Mass. And especially in this point in the Mass, where the priest says, May my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father, 
This is a place where our suffering becomes redemptive. And if we don't have this, then suffering is meaningless. But it can be something good for us and for the life of the world when we offer it up and unite it with Jesus. That's the first thing. Make our sacrifice of suffering in the waiting redemptive. The second thing is to be present. To be present in the moment because the agony of waiting takes place in anticipation and longing for the future. But God is not present to us in the future. God is present to us in the present. God can only be present to us and can only love us here and now because God is. Like this is, this is where God encounters us in the present moment. So if we spend too much time just thinking about, fantasizing about, waiting and longing for the future, then all we will have is just the suffering and the sorrow and the like feeling bummed that we're not there yet or that we don't have the thing yet. And then we fail to actually live the moment and be present because all we're doing is just longing for something that's yet to be and we fail to experience what God wants to give us right now. So the second thing is be present. And I think there's, there's a few ways that we can begin to live the present more. And actually live right now. Live as people of freedom and not live as people who are just bummed about the thing that they can't have. So to experience now, present, more, I would say maybe maybe three things that we can do. First is to have personal projects or hobbies or things that occupy our time. I think especially goal-oriented things that like I wake up in the morning and it's I don't just think about like the one thing that I'm waiting for, because that becomes like in some ways my, my main goal, my main focus, my main project of my life, if that's all I'm thinking about. So develop other projects, have other things to work on, have other things to occupy your time, to become better at, to like offer to the world around you. So whatever that might be, maybe that's like a, like a, like a fitness or a health goal or something where you're going to, you know, train for a marathon or start going to the gym more often. Maybe it's a creative goal. Maybe you're going to start like doing art or making videos or a podcast or music or, or something like that. Maybe it's uh, you, you become an entrepreneur or like get another job or, or do something like that or, or just like some kind of hobby, something to, something to spend your time on to like learn a skill or to do something of service to the people around you or something to, to spend your time on. Personal projects will help to like, in on some sense too, distract us from the project of waiting that we've been just so entrenched in. And it'll bring us back to roots in the present because I have a present project to work on. So that's the first thing, some kind of personal projects or hobbies or something like that to occupy us. So that can be relationships uh, because like people draw us out of ourselves. And a lot of the suffering of waiting is I, I like am so enmeshed in my own, like I can't have what I want right now. And that's very, it's very, it's kind of self-focused. So what relationships do is draw us away from looking inwards to looking outwards to another person. And it's also another person who hopefully we can share the burden of our waiting and our, and our sorrow with, um, but also we can then serve them. It, it draws us out of ourselves and they can build us up and encourage us and accompany us in the waiting. So, and especially if what your waiting looks like is waiting for some kind of like, I don't know, vocation or relationship, like you're single right now, you're trying to figure things out, like to invest in good quality relationships right now and not just like wait for the ideal relationship to come. Like who are the people in your life you can invest in more? Because there are people that will build you up, that'll distract you from this longing of like, It'll, keep, it'll also keep you out of like isolation because this is the devil's playground. I've talked about this a few videos before of like the devil can move and just like just just press down this weight of suffering and waiting when we're in isolation. So other people encourage us, accompany us and distract us from the like self-focus that we have in waiting and draw us out of ourselves. So that's the second thing, relationships. Third thing is prayer, duh, but, but like prayer, and I want to say prayer, not just praying for the thing you're waiting for. I, I know that this is a real thing for me. You just sit down to pray and all you think about is like, Lord, 
Lord, I just want this. I just want this right now. Why won't you give it to me? And then it's just like get all bummed in prayer time. Praying for just like, just to ask the Lord simply like, Lord, still waiting. Would you, would you give this to me? Would you give me direction? Would you give me clarity? Would you give me a destination? Would you show this to me? Uh, but then just like entrust that thing to him. But then enter into prayer to like be present with the Lord in some way. To read scripture. To pray the rosary. To, you know, to have prayer time that's not just focused on the thing that you want. But prayer time that's focused on relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, because this will root us more present. And this will help us to experience the love of the Lord and the love that like sets our heart on fire. Because this is the thing that we're ultimately made for. Nothing else satisfies us. If we're waiting for something, it's it can't be better than what Jesus has to offer us in relationship with him. It's the one thing that sets our hearts on fire. It's the one thing that we're made for. So lean into prayer. And not just praying for the thing you're waiting for but praying to have relationship and encounter with Jesus. So those would be the three things to help to be more present, I would say, is to have develop personal projects, hobbies, things to occupy your time, relationships, people to be with, that will draw us out of ourselves, and three, prayer for the sake of relationship with Jesus Christ. I hope that those things are practical things and they're thing, the things I'm working on uh, because it is so easy in the suffering of waiting just to like, be bummed and to, th- and to think just to like not live actually right now and just to like experience this great sorrow because all all I'm focused on is the thing that I can't have yet or the thing that I'm confused about the thing that I'm waiting for like God has so much for us right now and there's practical ways hopefully these are some of them to just be more present To maybe offer up the suffering that we're experiencing because waiting does involve real suffering. But patience is suffering well. So how do we suffer well? Some of these things. And to know that there is hope. We are people as Christians. We are people who must live with hope. um, But to experience the goodness that the Lord has for us right now. Even while it's hard. But eventually it will be really good. And... uh, Praise the Lord for whatever he has to teach us in the the suffering and in the waiting right now.